What concerns us, I think, tonight, and one of the things I want to deal with, is this, to me, is just another in a series of issues that confront you and I in this country. And um, part of the, the, that alarms me is not just the deed itself, if it's true. What alarms me is that you have to find these things out from private sources, that the media is an active participant in the cover-ups, which leads, of course, to the real topic that I want to deal with tonight. Remember when Jesus was before Pilate, the cynical uh, procurator said, what is truth? It's sort of just a rhetorical, cynical question. Few of us attempt to raise that question for ourselves. And yet if we think about it just a moment, truth is the most precious treasure that you and I uh, should be coveting. Truth is the key to success, fulfillment, victory, or achieving any worthwhile goal. And I'm going to suggest to you that the pursuit of truth is the greatest challenge no matter what your endeavors are. Now this fabulous century, as it's sometimes called, that we live in, has ushered in astonishing changes in the realms of technology and what have you. And yet, strangely, it has also probed new depths of darkness with devastating wars, monstrous new weapons, and has yielded the bloodiest, most revolutionary, most unpredictable century in all of history. And perhaps most fearsome of all, the part that scares me the most as you come to realize it, it has also ushered in the abandonment of truth. And in any cultural war, truth is the first casualty. Determining the nature of reality is the cornerstone of living. A man puts into practice tomorrow what he believes today. And to believe in the wrong model of history or the wrong purpose of living can lead to gross errors, great tragedies, devastating consequences. The correct, true view of man, God, history is the key to sanity, survival, and fulfillment for each of us. Now, these incredible contradictions that we experience in our present predicament result because too few people are taking the time to evaluate the issues, agree with the true, and resist the false. Most of us are born along by streams of influence that are managed by others inimical to our own interests. Most of the assumptions that govern our society, our nation, our families demand re-examination. And the shock that you'll come to as you do this is virtually all of them are false. And most of them arise from deliberate deceit. So I call the time that you and I are plunging into the age of deceit. And that's one of the most disturbing uh, discoveries I make as I started to prepare in this direction, the discovery that virtually all of our assumptions and preconceptions that surround our lives are, upon careful examination, false, and most of them deliberately promoted lies. And by the way, if you agree with that statement, you probably have been listening close enough. And so, let's examine a few of these. The first one, these are a few myths that we all believe. We live in a free country. Well, do we? Well, first of all, let's just touch, I won't get into an economic thing here, but the ancient serfs of the feudal periods spent three months of the year working for their master. You and I work into July because we're taxed at over 60% rate. You can figure it out. And I won't get into another one of these analogies about our federal debt, but let's assume we have a population of 250 million. How, how long would it take if every man, woman, and child put aside a dollar a month to retire the $4 trillion of debt. 1,333 years is not enough. And that's only on a $4 trillion estimate. The real debt is, of course, much larger than that. That gives you a rough feeling for it. 
But the real issue is um, most of us have grown up proud of our American heritage and the lofty ideals that framed this incredible experiment in human dignity and freedom we call this country. But now we find that the more we are informed about our government, the more we discover that it is the primary adversary of our freedoms and of, and of justice. As we carefully observe our national predicaments, we find that our investigatory agencies appear to be organizing cover-ups of wrongdoing rather than investigating and bringing to trial the criminals responsible. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, remem I'm reminded of an anecdote that Dr. Teller gave me. We were at a dinner, having dinner together and talking, and I, it, I asked him if he saw any hope for the survival of Western civilization. Typical question after dinner with Dr. Teller. <laughs> and I'll never forget his response, and I won't imitate his Hungarian accent. I'm not good at that sort of thing, but in his, in his very measured Hungarian accent, he said uh, that I'll answer as the same question. I'll give you the same answer I gave at, at, uh, at another uh, major banquet, not uh, at a major banquet uh, sometime earlier. He said, uh, Chuck, uh, you have to understand what an optimist is and a pessimist is. And of course, every, the, the, there are three or four others sitting at the table and they all knew something was coming and we sort of smiled. He said, a pessimist is someone who is always right but doesn't enjoy it. And we sort of chuckled. He says, an optimist is someone who thinks the future is uncertain. And we all winced as we realized the implications of that. But then he looked me right in the eye. He says, it's our duty to be an optimist because then we at least try. Now, I didn't think of it at the time, but I should have countered with him. The difference between an optimist and a pessimist seems to be that the pessimist has more information. <laughs> You see, another assumption you and I make in our society, another myth that I think we need to look re-examine, is that we have a free press protecting our freedoms. Sounds like I'm going to have to go on with this. Yeah. The most disturbing aspect of this uh, is the duplicity of the mass media. I'm not talking about bias. I'm not talking about the fact that, gee, there's a liberal establishment that tends to have the major voice here. It goes far beyond that. You see, the very ones who are supposed to be the guardians of our mandate are manifestly part of the problem. The spiking of dissent, the enforcement of the insanity of political correctness, the pursuit of their own self-serving agendas have denied the public access to today's realities and have prostituted one of a democracy's most sacred institutions. See, the notion that a free press was essential for society is one of the basic beliefs of our founding fathers. Truth and accuracy in reporting of facts was a long-standing tradition of journalists in our country for many years. Has that tradition changed is the question. Are we still being provided with truthful, timely, and unbiased reporting, or have we fallen victim to an unreliable media, a media that is driven by profit and not truth, or worse, one controlled by a cabal with a hidden agenda of its own. Now, I could, I'll, I'll spare you going through a whole historical perspective. You see, in the old country from which our, the colonies derived uh, during most of the 17th and 18th centuries, newspapers legally were intended to serve as public relations vehicles for their respective governments with the goal of creating positive feelings towards state authorities. And... Uh, 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 as A.F. Stevens d points out in the history of criminal law in England, he explained, if a ruler regarded as, uh, is regarded as the superior of the subject as being by the nature of his position presumably wise and good, no censure should be cast upon him. That was sort of the mentality. Common people were supposed to sit still before the government officials minding their manners and so forth. Now, as a reaction to that tradition, our founding fathers, in developing their theories and practical models of individual rights, believed that a, that a free press was essential for a healthy, free society. And their strong emphasis on the, those issues related to freedom of speech, uh, as well as related to constitutional protections, provided a framework within, the, within which the press could operate freely and primarily without governmental interference. Although our Bill of Rights guarantees us a free press, it unfortunately does not demand that it be truthful. And uh, 
It's interesting that as response to the protections of the Bill of Rights, thousands of local independent newspapers were, afforded, uh, were formed throughout our country, coupled with a self-imposed moral uh, dictate to report news items, and they, they were generally well-researched and, and uh, in general factual. Outstanding investigative reporting was the hallmark of our early journalists. It is interesting to note that mid-19th century American journalism was predominantly Christian in its perspective, and journalism was the single most professional activity. In short, journalists were held in high esteem. And, um, of course, in the current uh, century, a major turning point for the media came in 1952 when the International Commission of the Press um, ruled that the American government was conducting so many operations it holds a secret from its people that it can no longer be said to have a pre free press. And this statement shocked many Americans. See, what makes the news today, of course, is what a reporter, editor, publisher find worth reporting. More often than not, it'll be what corroborates their own attitudes, beliefs, or the agenda that's been put onto them by their owners. And today's journalists prefer to form public opinion rather than inform it. The ownership base, of course, of our written media has changed radically. Today, it's become very narrow and concentrated in the hands of a wealthy few. I can remember sitting down at lunch with Otto von Habsburg, a member of the European Parliament. His father ruled the world, I uh, ruled uh, Europe until uh, 1918. Uh, he said to me, Chuck, the concentration of power in America is frightening. And I have to admit to you, when he said that at the time, I didn't know what he meant. Uh, subsequently, I did my homework, or at least started my homework. Now, um, today there are only about four newswire services and about five, and by the way, United Press is owned by the Arabs, as you probably know, the, about five newspaper chains uh, in turn control over 95% of America's newspapers. And uh, now, the lack of accurate and timely reporting has also been evidenced in media releases released by the United States government. Mainline media appears to be controlled and unreliable and even reported incidents of mysterious news media blackouts. And we go through a whole list of things in which, strangely, truth that gets out gets squelched very quickly. Um, and uh, now in our ministry, of course, we don't take sides on these things, but we are alarmed at what appears to be a lack of timely and truthful reporting by both the private and governmental media. And it's frightening. And uh, so that's... Uh, that leads me then to the third myth that I want to deal with. Perhaps it's more generic than all of these, and that is that we are a culture committed to truth. And that, as you start to investigate, is tragically untrue. Early in this century, many intellectuals in our society became enamored with the doctrines of Freudianism, the materialism of Feuerbach, the nihilism of Nietzsche, the dialectic of Hegel, the communism of Marx, and along with behaviorism, socialism, existentialism, that is, do your own thing, and rationalism, Fabianism, and humanism. Dave Brees, a friend of mine, uh, you all probably know Dave, uh, has written, I think, a delightful book called The Seven Men Who Rule the World from Their Graves. And it's basically highlights in precy form, but very articulately, the impacts of Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, George Wellhausen, Sigmund Freud, John Maynard Keynes, Soren Kierkegaard, and of course, John Dewey. And in fact, it's through the teachings of John Dewey's humanism, his atheism, his autonomous man, his amorality, his evolution, one world socialism, all of this has permeated our educational system. It, and and uh, it has excluded from the text, our textbooks the moral and biblical teachings, which have been the bedrock of our American culture. Now, it's interesting that the continual upscaling of school budgets has resulted in continually depressing performances. Now, I had always assumed that the ineptitude of our educational establishment comes from mismanagement. That no matter how much money you throw at them, it just gets worse, is because they don't know how to manage. I was, I discover, very naive. The astonishing shock that awaits any of you that'll take the trouble to investigate this is that that is the intended result. You need to do some homework about the deliberate dumbing down of America. That is the express goal. Uh, the subversive goal of Goals 2000, outcome-based education and related programs. There are a number of good books out on this by people, citizens, who have taken the trouble to charge into this. I encourage you to check out the book called Brave New Schools by Barrett Close. She's a, it's spelled K-J-O-S, she's Norwegian, but a sharp gal, and, and uh, uh, check, do it out, check, check it out for yourself. 
Now, it's interesting, a guy by the name of Alan Bloom, some years ago, a few years ago, published a book called The Closing of the American Mind. And I think he was probably the most shocked guy in the world to find that he was on the cover of a major news magazine because of that book. He was simply summarizing at the close of an educational career his experience of 30 years at the University of Chicago. But he, he made some in, a very articulate book, if you track it down, The Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom. In our strive in universities to be open to multiculturalism, we have abandoned the quest for truth, in fact, denying its existence. See, in exchange for value relativism, this whole approach that it doesn't matter what you believe, uh, it's up to you, your, your values are relative. You establish your own values. When you, the minute you do that, you say that truth is relative, you've denied the existence of truth, and if you deny the existence of truth, you'll never find truth. In fact, the non-obvious result of that emphasis in education is that our young people now don't see how history has any relevance to the future. If there is no absolute truth, what is there that you can learn from the past? It becomes really, excuse the expression, academic. And uh, see, what we've successfully done in our universities is disconnect ourselves from the painful lessons of 2,000 years of what we call Western civilization. And so Alan Bloom demonstrated very thoroughly, I think, in his book, just from secular sources, from a secular perspective, that relativism is intellectually and morally bankrupt. And so therefore, the American youth that, have been, uh, that are uh, being produced by our university establishment has thus been disenfranchised from our heritage. And uh, how will one find truth if he doesn't, he, knows it does, he doesn't know that it exists? Now the problem is we now have two generations of graduates subjected to these godless philosophies through our schools. The children from this background have now become the parents, teachers, political leaders, new media people, playwrights, actors, entertainers, clergymen, business and professional people. Ignorant of the great moral and religious strengths of our country, they are unable to impart the, these to a new generation. What's the result? No surprise, neo-paganism. See, modern cultic uh, pagan religions have built their appeal on the vacuum that's been left. The mind reels in attempt to understand the insanity of paganism. No one knows how much substance of life has been poured out before the graven images of time upon the stained altars of the gods who are not and the demons who are. The statues of the deities are few, but the gods of the mind are many. Of course, the modern New Age movement insists that being uh, 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 that, 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 that choose to live in har that you should live in harmony with nature, moving in the lines of its life force, to dis that you will discover and be part of the great utopian wave of the future. The New Age movement carries its propaganda everywhere, calling people to cooperate with the destiny that they say is built into the social structure. What's the result of all of this? Frankly, moral freefall. America, if you haven't looked around, is in deep trouble. And I'm not going to prattle about the federal debt. Any businessman knows that cash flow is a symptom, not a cause. And what we have here is a, a spiritually uh, uh, apathetic society that didn't even murmur in 1962 when, citing no precedence, a so-called liberal, Supreme Court abolished prayer for the public schools and the next year abolished Bible reading in the schools. And if you look at as many over, I have over 80 charts I could bore you with that were all improving up till the early 60s and then degenerate rapidly. Starting rise in uh, uh, teenage pregnancies up 556% uh, venereal disease. The, uh, the, um, over 35,000 new VD cases per day in this country. Family divorce had declined for 15 years, but then it started, it's tripled every year since. The SAT scores previously had been relatively stable. They started the remarkable continuing decline. In fact, to, embar to mask the embarrassing results, they've recently, you may notice, have been redefined the standards. In other words, they shift the reference point. Now, what will puncture this myth is the embarrassing per uh, performance of homeschoolers. They outperform the public schools by better than 20% any, way, any which way you look at it. And uh, 
but we'll move on. The high, princi the, the high principles that made America great have been lost. And by the way, we're not talking about the low classes, the welfare state, all of that. We're talking about the highest offices in the land. There are no, there's no longer a connection between character and destiny. You've got peace prize given to terrorists, murderers, notoriously unsuitable people. Moral teaching, proper standards, respect for rules have been removed from our schools. Meaningless courses in values clarification and the tenets of secular humanism, which, by the way, was defined by the Supreme Court as a religion in 1961, have been substituted. People claim that morals have changed. No, God makes morals, and he has not changed his mind. He has and still does hate wickedness. An old friend of mine, Larry Abrams, is an author, and uh, he's written a number of books, and I won't go through all that. Very articulate guy, neat guy, loves this country. But he read, I, I want to excerpt something from his, one of the last newsletters he wrote while still being in the United States. He says, my people came to America to live as free men, and I had to leave it for the same reason. The greatest single U.S. problem is the increasing loss of the concept of justice within the hearts and the minds of the American people. Uh, Larry was talking to a student group, and some students uh, asked him, what is the biggest problem in America? We've got a lot of problems. What's the biggest problem? And he started to answer, and he paused. He said, that question's too important for me to hip shoot. Let me think about it. He got his address. I'll write you an answer. It's very analogous to Norman Schwarzkopf, who was speaking, and someone asked him, what's the, biggest, what's the biggest problem in America? And he came back and said, lack of integrity. Anyway, uh, uh, Larry's response in his following newsletter is a response to that student thing. What is the biggest problem in America? It, the loss of the con any concept of justice within the hearts and minds of the American people. We're not talking Supreme Court. We're talking about the hearts and minds of the American people. Once lost, that concept is hardly ever recovered. Justice is no longer the base on which America conducts its affairs. Clinton and Rodham didn't cause this condition. They are the sad consequences of it as are the legions of bureaucrats in the FTC, IRS, SEC, HHS, and the jurors of the Rodney King, Reginald Denny, and Menendez trials, and the, uh, as are the killing of Mrs. Weaver and the baby by the FBI, the torching of Waco by the BATF, the drive-by shootings, the intellectual insanity of political correctness, the institutionalizing of perverts as a core constituency of the Democratic Party. The politics of envy sponsors an entire body of law that amounts to what the French philosopher Frederick Bestiat called legal plunder. The maze of law that guards this plunder has grown so vast that it's now impossible to even know what is legal and what is not. My commitment has always been, as yours should be, not to a plot of ground, but to a moral philosophy. And as long as the United States was the finest example of that philosophy, as long as it struggled justly to live by its high ideals, I would fight to preserve and protect it. And I did so. But when my country becomes, as it has, the primary purveyor and financier of all I abhor, and without any reasonable sign of reversing itself, then I must choose a different venue from which to carry on the war, begun by Burke and Madison, Jefferson, John Adams, Hamilton, and Jay. Now, he wrote this, by the way, before he had the benefit of the O.J. Simpson verdict, or the Oklahoma City bombing, or the so-called suicides of Vince Foster, and the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Borden, or the accidental death of Commerce Secretary Ron Brown. Now, he has uh, uh, relocated, in his case, for reasons that are personal to him, to Santiago, Chile. And he still writes his newsletter. It's published in this country, but he delivers it from abroad. Now, the root of all of this, you know, as you start looking at our society, it's fascinating. One of the most obvious lies is the primary tenet of our civilization. It's called evolution. The term really is probably misapplied, but the net of it is, is that our schools, our culture, our scientific establishment, our politics, our entire culture is based on the presumption that we are some kind of cosmic accident. You know, from the goo to you by way of the zoo, as somebody is summarizing. <laughs> Now, what's tragic about that, that might have been excusable in the days of Darwin and following. The tragedy is that modern science has repeatedly refuted that. It should be on the rubbish heap of theories because there is an, a 
abundance of evidence everywhere you look that it no longer explains facts as we know them, if it ever did, but without getting beating that one to death. Now, if you haven't discovered the writings of Michael Denton, he wrote a book called Evolution, colon, A Theory in Crisis, just a competent scientist pointing out that evolution is no longer a tenable explanation for what we now know. And, and there's hundreds of examples, but the most uh, 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 final of them all is the DNA molecule, a digital code. And I won't beat out that here tonight. But the point is, with this as a premise in our schools, is any wonder that our kids have no sense of destiny, no sense of uh, purpose? Uh, um, they're accidents. I mean, what purpose is there in life and uh, in their mind? And this whole idea of relativism, that means that truth does not exist. And um, socialism is really... Uh, and the bondage of centralism is really a, a, a byproduct of that same thinking. And the whole psychobabble that we're all plunged into is, is a, it's nothing more than a denial of sin responsibility. Now, why am I getting into all this, in this from this pulpit or this uh, platform? Well, who is the God of this world? Satan, exactly. And uh, that's not just some quip thing. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 and 1 John 4.4 4 use that very title of him, the God of this world. And you may recall, as a third corroboration, that when Jesus was on the Mount of Temptation, as we call it, that one of those temptations was one in which Satan shows um, our Lord, brings before his awareness, all the nations of the world and makes the boast that they're all mine, and I can give them to whoever I will, and they're yours if you worship me. Now, that's not a temptation if it's not based on reality. If I was going to offer you uh, the, um, the floor headquarters complex, so prominently along the freeway here, uh, if I was going to try and sell it to you, are you tempted to buy it? Hardly, because, you know, well, I don't own it, you follow me? For you to be tempted into a deal, you have to at least believe that it's mine. Or the Brooklyn Bridge is the classic model, or what have you, you know. Well, it's interesting that Jesus didn't challenge his assertion. And, of course, the, you can study the temptations for many other lessons, but one of them that will emerge from that is the reality that this world that you and I are so conscious of, that are so uh, immersed in, is Satan's turf. They're his. Now, he's a usurper. You start that whole uh, study in Genesis 3, but the point is, and it's temporary because the mandate has been purchased. And uh, the most important escrow closing in history is in Revelation chapter 5. That's like that. When the one who purchased the deed comes to take possession of what's his. And that's going to get very exciting. And it appears not to be very far off. Now, if Satan is the god of this world, the next question is, what is his primary weapon in his pursuits? In John 8, 44, let's, uh, we've got uh, time here. Let's turn to John chapter, I love John 8, by the way. John 8, you know, so often when we read the Scripture, we can be sort of lulled asleep by the politeness of the King James or whatever you're reading. And um, it's, uh, it always interests me. The, um, uh, in John 8, verse 18, Jesus is talking about bearing witness of himself. And when he gets to verse 18, he says, I am one that bears witness of myself, and, I, the, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Speaking, of course, of God the Father. In verse 19, they said unto him, Where is thy father? Now, as you read that, you may not pick up what they're really saying. They're making an allusion to their belief that he's a bastard. That Joseph, that he, you know, that, 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 that you, know, you get the picture. Well, it's interesting. He is going to respond to that before the chapter's over in rather exciting terms, in my view. But he said, Jesus answered, you neither know me nor my father. If he'd known me, you would have known my father. Now, they're talking about different fathers, obviously. The Pharisees are alluding to Joseph, unmarried uh, Mary when she's pregnant, presumably. Well, I mean, from their point of view. Um, but he's talking about God the Father. And it goes on here, and, um, and uh, he, he, he goes on this way. But when he finally, he gets down here. Um, hmm. Oh, there's so much here. I could be fun to spend the whole evening on John 8. But uh, it... Uh, 
And verse, pick it up on verse 52. And, and Jesus said unto him, Now we know thou hast a demon. Abram is dead in the prophets, and thou sayest, If any man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than the fa our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom do you make yourself? And Jesus said, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, and of whom ye say uh, that he is, your, uh, he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Do you see it tensing up here a little bit? <laughs> Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and thou hast seen Abraham? And then Jesus said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, um, Before Abraham was, I am. Now every time you and I run the risk of not understanding something in the Scripture, the Pharisees will underline your Bible for you by threatening to throw stones at him. So you get to verse 59, it says, Then they took up stones to cast at him, but he hid himself, and so forth. See, the point is, what they understood, most, most of us as readers don't realize what Jesus is saying in verse 58, he is claiming to be the voice of the burning bush. But the key verse that I really was headed to is verse 44. Well, let's pick it up about verse... Um, uh, 41 and say, Ye do the deeds of your father. And then they said to him, We are not, you see, we are not born of fornication. We are, see, that same theme is on their side of this at the confrontation. They keep referring to him being a bastard. We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. He said, If God were your father, ye would love him. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my words? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. Because I tell you the truth, he believed me not." And he goes on. Hairy stuff, back and forth. And um, it's an exciting chapter. But the key point here is he, he nails down the author of lies as Satan. And um, now, when you look at the book of Revelation, chapter 12, we encounter the red dragon. He there is also identified as the uh, father of lies and, uh, the, and the Satan and so forth. Now, it's interesting that this emphasis continues because there is a day coming, and maybe very close upon us for all we know, that uh, the man of sin, the, this coming world leader, as I prefer to call him, is... Um, going to come forth. He has 33 different titles in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. Most people tend to call him the Antichrist. But this coming leader that's going to make such an impact on the world, it's going to be such a major player in the final climax. There is an interesting verse in Ch Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. There are many of these kinds of verses. I'm just picking one to make the point. In Daniel 8, 25, speaking of him, in fact, we might pick it up verse 23 to get the flavor of this description of him. It says, In the latter time, when the transgressions are come to the full, and a king of fierce countenance, that's one of those titles, and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. That shall be powered by Satan. And he shall destroy marvelously, and shall prosper and continue, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Now, by the way, this is one of those several places, if you're reading carefully, You'll find that both here and in uh, Revelation 13, one of his characteristics that he overcomes the holy people. And one of the problems that are, that's often advanced by critics is that in Matthew 16, by Caesarea Philippi, when uh, Peter uh, has this opportunity to indulge in this incredible uh, 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 you know, uh, affirmation, yeah. Jesus says to him, who, who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that gives rise to Jesus making that famous statement. But he says, uh, uh, speaking of his church, I will build my church, which means it's future, and he's doing the building. He says, and the gates of hell, or Hades, shall not prevail against it. Same word of overcoming. Uh, we know from a number of passages of Scripture that the church will not be overcome by Satan, and yet we find several verses using the same precise language. Uh, saying that the saints in this period will be overcome. And that's a mystery until you realize that not all saints are members of the church. 
There are people saved before the church was formed. The church had to be formed after the ascension. It was formed in Acts 2 following. Just as there were people saved prior to the existence of a church, there's also going to be people saved after the church is removed. And uh, that's, what, that's how you can understand what Jesus meant in Matthew 11, where he speaks of John the Baptist. He says, the many, uh, John, uh, of all men born of woman, there's none greater than John. That's quite a statement. And in his next breath, he says, but he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. What does that mean? Does that mean John wasn't saved? No, it means that he is not the ones that he's, Jesus is focusing on at that point on. It's interesting that uh, Luke 16, 16 and other passages point out that the Old Testament ends with John the Baptist. And something new is underfoot here. There are people that will be saved after the church is raptured. Dave Hunt has said, I think at our last conference, he made the interesting statement from the platform that he believes that more people will be saved after the rapture than before. That's kind of a wild statement. Incidentally, while, while you're uh, in that mood also, he believes there'll be more people raptured out of China than the United States. That's kind of an interesting, you to chew on that one for a while. Doesn't mean he's right, but he's got an interesting perspective. Anyway, um, uh, Daniel 8.25 is one of them. We're going to be subjected to, uh, oh wait, I, did, did I, get, I did finish, didn't finish the pass. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I, I got distracted here about this. Um, uh, he shall, uh, verse 20, 824 was his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and he shall prosper and continue and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. Verse 25, and through his policy also, he shall cause deceit to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. And he shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. One of these prophecies, of course, of this final world ruler. Interesting, though, one of the things that characterizes him, not just himself personally, but his policies and the environment that he ushers in is an environment of deceit. Now, I know many of you are saying, gee, that must mean that the Bill Clinton must be the Antichrist. I don't think so. <laughs> There's another passage that says that he won't have the desire of women, so I leave that alone. <laughs> Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And it's speaking again of this, this one that's coming. Here he, in verse 3, he's called the man of sin, the son of perdition. We all know who he's talking about who uh, opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So he's not only accepted by the Jews as a Messiah and the, the, the would-be Christians at that time as, as their Lord or false Christ, if you will, but he also be accepted by Muslims as the last Mahdi, the 12th Imam, or whatever. And so that he, above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then it goes on. And we get down here... Um, uh, 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 verse 9, even him, oh, incidentally, the key point here as we go through this, as long as I'm into this a little bit, verse 6, we now know what restraineth it that he might be revealed in his time. The only thing that's ever restrained sin in the world ever in the Bible is God. So this is, of course, the Holy Spirit. And for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now hinders will continue to hinder until he, that person, be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed. You see, I believe the revelation of who this guy is will happen after the rapture, so don't waste your time on these silly theories floating around all the time. Whom the Lord shall consume with his bear of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Verse 9 is where I'm headed. Even him whose coming, that is the Satan, who is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. And the Greek text implies a very specific, ultimate lie will be um, on, on, on their case. You, they will not be able to save themselves by their intellect. No one's ever been saved by their intellect. That's simply a tool. Some have more than others, but that it doesn't, shouldn't surprise you to realize that that's not the basis of God's salvation, not your intellect. And your intellect is not sufficient to protect you against these days. What is? Only the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual issue. And uh, so forth. Now, 
this business, uh, the, we can't get into this thing without talking about Second, um, 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter days, the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving by them who believe and know the truth. And it goes on. The Bible says in many, many places that there's not that deceit is not unique to our age, but the extent of it is substantial. And it's, it's probably the most difficult admission for us in this country because of its unique heritage. And I think one of the challenges that you and I have is not to let our kingdoms get confused. See, on the one hand, I think most of us in this room, to varying degrees probably, love this country. Many of the families here represented have had members of their family give their lives for this country. And I sometimes have the cynical presumption that if they could look at our administration today, they would pass. You and I, I believe, because of the unique heritage that we enjoy, are going to be held accountable for the protection of our mandate. <laughs> I was startled. I paused because I, I just received a, a book of quotations. A brand new book is published by Dan McKinnon. It has a, it had a uh, forward by Newt Gingrich. Just a book of quotations. One of the one of the chapters is on patriotism and, war, and honor and so forth. In fact, the title of the book quotations is "Words of Honor." They're just quotations. I wonder what on earth did he send me this for? And I discovered that I'm in it. So I'm, you know, I don't, I know what that means. I'm between Albert Einstein and George Bernard Shaw, I think. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean physically. And uh, and furthermore, the quote that's attributed to me is not original with me. I apparently said it once, and it was picked up by somebody, and somehow I got this book. But um, that uh, you have no right to bemoan the loss of that which you didn't fight to protect. And I, I, I have said that several times. I know I got that. I can't remember exactly where I got that, but I know I got that from somebody. It's not original to me, obviously. But anyway, it, it's attributed to me there. The point is, I think that's true of all of us, is that you and I have a mandate, a vote. And our response is not with bullets, it's with ballots. And I think you and I need to pray and be uh, heads up on this election. And I don't think the presidential election that's forthcoming is the big one. I think by the time you get in that chair, you owe so many obligations to so many people, you are but a figurehead anyway of the power groups that put you there. But I think the important races are the hundreds of others, the freshmen, congressmen, and senators, guys with principle, guys with strength of character. That's what you should be praying for. And that, that maybe there's a hope for this road. But I think you and I are going to be um, held accountable for that stewardship. And yet, having said all that, the real issue that you and I have, the more you love this country, the more difficult a problem you have, in a sense. And I say this because I've had a tough time with this issue of the last few years. Because I've spent a good part of my life, in one way or another, uh, loving this country. From the time that I was a preschooler, and my parents who were immigrants were learning their citizenship papers. You, you, it's, being an American means something special in a home like that. And I spent my college years uh, marching in review at, with, the naval, at the, with the Brigade of Midshipmen at the Naval Academy for whoever happened to be visiting Washington that week. And uh, that gets in your blood. And I, in addition to my service time, I also spent a good part of my executive career in the defense establishment, both in think tanks and the intelligence community, and then, and then uh, uh, ultimately uh, serving on the boards of uh, uh, four different uh, publicly traded defense contractors, chairman of the board, chief executive officer, four different defense contractors. When you, having lived most of my life in one way or another connected with that community, let me tell you, this country means a great deal to me. It's not easy to be up here and, and hammer away at some of these things. And yet, let me tell you my biggest problem, not my biggest problem, but a big problem I've got. And that is, 
I have a tendency to get my kingdoms confused. I need to remind myself frequently that we're passing through, that our boss is a monarch, not an elected representative. He's a king. And um, so, um, moving, what I'm going to urge you to do, and I mean urge with an underline, is I would like each of you to make a commitment to yourself. First of all, really do a serious, in depth study of Ephesians chapter 6 particularly verses 10 through 20. That's a passage where Paul lays out for you what we call the armor of God. You see, the problem you and I have is you and I are engaged in a war, a desperate war. And we're already in it if you're in Christ. Now, if you're not in Christ, if you're unsaved, you're already the enemy's own. And so, you, you, you know, this refers to those of you that are serious about God, that are Christians, that are, you are in a warfare. And by the way, you're on enemy's ground. And what Paul admonishes you to do there is put on the whole armor of God. Now, notice it's an imperative. It's something you have to do. And you notice he doesn't say pick from this list of a half a dozen things the ones you like best. No, he says put on the whole armor of God. He says that several times, twice. Now, you don't put the armor on in the middle of the skirmish. You put the armor on beforehand. And you make sure it's complete. And you make sure that it's operative. And I'm going to encourage you to, uh, to uh, do that with some intensity. Now, I've talked here about the age, age of deceit. Let me ask you another sort of a test question. What's the most dangerous source of lies? What is the most dangerous source of lies? My suggestion for an answer? Ourselves. Ourselves. Psalm 51.6 God says he would have truth in our inward parts. What is your most important stewardship? Answer, not your family. Your wife's hitting you in the elbow, guys. The family, the family. Not your career, family. No, there's something even more important as a stewardship than even your family. That's your heart. That's your heart. And um, 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul instructs us to take every thought captive. And uh, what you really need to do as part of your study also is to understand how you're organized internally. And I don't mean from an anatomy textbook in terms of organs and muscles and skeletons. No, no, no. I'm talking about the software, not the hardware. What do you mean by the software? Call it soul, spirit, whatever you like. You won't find out how that's organized in man's literature because man doesn't know. Sigmund Freud has written a lot in that area, but that's all conjecture and not even accepted uh, uh, in modern by, by many uh, uh, scientists and in, in even in that field of study. The point is, if you want to find out how, the only way you can find out how software's organized is to look at the designer's manual when you have it in your lab. And seven times the New Testament says, you are the temple of God. The temple of God has a slightly different architecture than the tabernacle did. It has some unusual features added to it. And I encourage you, if you're interested in this, uh, briefly to get our briefing package called The Architecture of God, available in the, uh, or excuse me, The Architecture of Man. Uh, in the, it's in available at Christian bookstores and, uh, and so forth. But, uh, or even better yet, if you really want to understand it, and also to understand it practically, I encourage you to uh, find a, get, get a copy of my wife's book, The Way of Agape, which has, a, uh, has all that background, but then has a practical guide. And her sequel to that, Be Transformed, is of course, is just that, the sequel to that. It is um, a, uh, uh, a textbook and workbook and practical uh, uh, guidance on Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, which will be our closing scripture. If you want to turn to um, the book of Romans, chapter 12, the key verse tonight, then, trying to summarize all this quickly, is 
particularly verse two, chapter, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let's focus on verse 2, where Paul tells us, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, in order to do that, you have to know what your mind is, by the way. And if you and I wouldn't think mind, you think brain, you've missed the point. It turns out mind and brain are not the same thing, especially as the Scripture uses it. So there's a whole part of that study is to understand what we really mean by mind. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you become transformed? How do you renew your mind? That's your challenge uh, this coming week to dig into that. And uh, I encourage you, if you can get your hands on a copy of either the way of God or better yet, be transformed. Uh, that might prove useful. Now, the, the, um, the main reason I wanted to get into all this tonight is because I think the jeopardy that you and I, you and I have um, is very substantial. That what we've talked about has always been true to some extent, but I think the deceit and the confusion and the error that we're mired in is amazingly prevalent everywhere. And this is a year in which I think several things are going to be true. First of all, you and I are facing some tough decisions as we approach an election year. But also I should emphasize that no matter how it comes up, the experts that will admit it are expecting huge turbulence in this country and throughout the world. The election is only part of it. The rise of terrorism with major, major technology available to them is going to be increasingly impacting this country. We're not used to that. Some countries have had a lot of it and have, been, have gotten used to it. I don't think you ever get used to it, um, but I think that's another factor. The military instability, geopolitical instability in this planet Earth. Middle East, of course, is an explosion just waiting to happen, and the preparations continue every day. The weapon influx into the Middle East is gigantic and continuing. The, it, it, the, we'll be running some articles in our newsletter on Asia, an uh, update on not just China, but the whole Far East in general. It also is highly likely over the coming years to be an explosion for lots of reasons. Most of us in this uh, may not be as sensitive to some of that, but let me tell you, it, everywhere you look, you can see instability. Now, the Scripture says the prudent see danger and take refuge. The simple or foolish keep going and suffer from it, for it. That's twice in the book of Proverbs, 22.3 and 27.12. Um, basic, basic advice. Do your homework. But as you look at that, there's lots of places you need to start doing some homework. But the number one place is Ephesians, is Ephesians chapter 6 and and. Uh, and following what, what derives from that, I strongly encourage you to recognize the reality that you and I are in a warfare, a spiritual warfare. And whether or not the, your, whatever views you might have about the Randy Weaver thing or Waco or Oklahoma City or Vince Foster or Admiral Borda or, or um, Ron Brown notwithstanding, it doesn't take a lot of insight to realize that we are in big trouble in this country, governmentally, financially, militarily, every which way. But those are all symptoms of a deeper problem, a spiritual problem. And those spiritual problems are going to affect not just our nation and our communities, it's going to affect your family. And what you need to do is get serious, I mean get serious, about doing your homework, about being prepared. Find out what Paul means when he talks about the uh, shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and uh, the girdle of truth, and so forth. Those are not just figures of speech. It turns out each one of those is a, a skillfully chosen idiom, incidentally not by Paul, but by the Holy Spirit, because he uses those idioms in the Old Testament. This isn't him looking at a Roman soldier drawing an analogy. That may be, it might have been true in Paul's mind. It's much deeper than that. The Holy Spirit's fingerprints are all over that passage. And uh, find out what these things really mean. The shield of faith. A shield is worthless if it has holes in it. Does your faith have some holes in it? Are there some doubts in your 
profile of what you think you believe. Then fix them. Take those doubts. Track them down. Find out the reality. If there's something bothering you in your profile of faith, do the homework. Now, get it behind you. Now, it doesn't mean that you'll have every question answered. I don't mean that. But you know what I'm talking about. If there's something that's still really, you can't quite get your mind around, do the homework. Pursue it. Plug that hole. That shield of faith is the maneuverable part of your armor. Get used to it. Everything hangs on your girdle, girdle of truth. That's your belt. Everything else touches that. What is truth? What kind of truth are you depending on? The truth of the world? The truth of the universities? Or the only truth that's on the planet Earth? God's Word. What a glib cliche, but it's true. And what is truth? It's when the Word and the deed become one. That sounds like something you should say in front of a teepee, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> God's Word became true when the, the promise He made of a Messiah became incarnated. The ultimate truth is the person of Jesus Christ. That's what he means in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh from the Father but by me, he says. What a narrow thing to say, and yet very true. Girdle of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate covered the heart. A piercing of breastplate was usually fatal. You can't let that happen. What are you talking about? The breastplate of what? Righteousness. Who's righteousness? Yours? Hope not. His. And the helmet of salvation protects the head. Do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're, do you believe you're going to heaven or do you know you are? Big difference. The assurance of your salvation. Critical. Critical. If you're going to really fight the battle, you need to know that. Who are you depending on? Your faithfulness or his? I know in whom I believed and that he is able to keep that which I have committed them unto him against that day. And um, the sword of the Spirit. Well, everybody knows that one. That's the Word of God, right? Roman sword was 24 inch of chira, uh, 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 sharpened on both edges. In those days, it was typically, you typically have a long sword that was sharp on one edge and it was used for cutting kinds of motions. He had a cock it, in effect, didn't use it. The Romans conquered the world by going a little different style. A short sword, 24 inches of chira, sharpened both edges, and with that, they could get in close and, and hit and take their opponent, even whoever was off balance, etc. Now, the Machaira caused Rome to conquer the world, but there's something about a Machaira you need to understand. It took extensive training and practice to use it. If you just handed one, you'd get clobbered. If you knew how to use it, you were invincible. If this is sitting on your desk, it doesn't do you much. Where's it got to be? First of all, in your heart. Because you may not, you can't go for your card file when you're hanging, you know, by your fingers on a cliff. You, you, what's in the card file doesn't help you. You got to have it where it's handy. The sword of the Spirit. You need to do your homework. Can you find the basis of your faith in Scripture? Do you know in what you, why you believe what you believe? Can you lead someone to Christ? Can you, can, you, uh, can you deal with that? Can you lead a Jewish person to Christ using entirely only the Old Testament? You see, that's easy, easily done. I mean, it's easy to lay out that path, but you, have to, you, you don't make it up. You learn it, practice it, you, you know, it takes training. You're in a warfare. You're a warrior. And of course, after Paul goes through all those different pieces, and, and I encourage you to study those carefully because they have tremendous depth behind each one, he talks about the heavy artillery. Heavy artillery is prayer. 